genius, genius draws no color line. And so it is fitting that Marian Anderson should raise her voice in tribute to the noble Lincoln whom mankind will ever honor. Miss Marian Anderson. And welcome to Going Uptown with Uptown Brown. This is your host, Tyree Brown, also known as Uptown Brown on WBCA 102.9 FM on your radio station. But we're on being in today, and I'm blessed to have as my guest today, principals of the Oscar Michaud Family Theater Program Company, as well as the cast of the Miss Marian Anderson and Friends Project. Today, we will talk about Miss Marian Anderson. And Miss Marian Anderson was born on February 27th, 1905, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She will later on become one of the world's best gospel singer and classical music singer. Um, in 1939, she was denied to sing in her hometown, Philadelphia, at Constitution Hall by the Daughters of American Revolution. This story was made all over the world. And it was made, and <laughs> this story was made all around the world, and the story was reported, and that became, made Marian Anderson famous. But on Easter Sunday, 1939, Mary Anderson was sing, given the chance to sing at the Lincoln Memorial by some of her powerful friends. But we will talk a little bit more about that later. Right now, I want to introduce to you my guests for today. We have Minister Debbie Mosley, Mark and Sky Forts, and Sister Monica Anderson Spencer, who will be playing Marian Anderson in our, in our um, production. My question goes to Ms. Minister Debbie first. Tell us a little something about yourself. Hi. Uh, first, I want to give my honor to God, who was ahead of my life. My name is Minister Deborah Mosley, and um, I just love this theater company, and I'm playing Miss Darling, the barmaid, at the famous Evelyn's Delight, as we call it, because everyone comes through there, you know, to tell us where they're going and what they're going to be about and what they plan on doing in their future if it happens, but it does happen. And it's just an honor to see them come through this bar you know, and they tease me because I don't sing. But it's okay. They say, don't say you can't sing, but say I never tried it. But I can sing just a little bit. As you can see in the play, you will see that sometimes. I'm going to fool them. But I love preaching. I love doing liturgical dancing. And I go mo motivational speaker when I'm asked to go speak at different churches. And that's what I love to do. So you are a minister at a church right now. Yes, I am. Can you tell us the journey on how you became a minister? Well, it was way back in the 60s and the 70s when I, mm -hmm. you know, first got that call. But, you know, how you, when you're younger, you say you walk away, and God said, come back here. And I would walk away again. He said, well, I got something else for you to do. And I would walk away, still walk away. And when I was working at New England Baptist Hospital, I used to read, take Bibles out and read to some of the patients. And that's where it really started. And I said, well, God got me doing all this. He has something for me to do. You know, and again, I would walk away. You know how you go to college and you stray away from church and everything. But then when I graduated, God said, oh, I got you back. So when I got out, you know, about college, I went back to church. You know, and that's when we got to start. I used to go to um, camps with different kids, you know, religious camps. And I would be a lay staff. And then one day I told the pastor, it was Pastor Hugo Anderson, that I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to be on this pulpit and I'm going to preach one day. 
So when the kids were sleeping one day, he says to me, okay, I want you to write a sermon. I said, okay, I'm put on the spot. So I wrote a sermon. He said, I meet you at 6.30 in the morning while the kids are asleep with a cup of coffee. Now pretend you're on that pulpit and then preach. And that's what I did. And he said to me, the next Sunday, you're going to be on that pulpit. I want you to preach. And that's how I got into preaching. And then I, you know, I wasn't going to seminary school then. Mm -hmm. And then 2005, that's when another pastor came in and said, oh, no, you need to go to seminary school. And that's how I got to seminary school. I went from 2005, and I graduated in 2008 with a degree in urban ministry. And that's how I got my call. But then again, I was fighting with God at one time because I lost so many members in my family at that time. I mm. lost five sisters, my oldest niece, and my dad. Mm. So it was like, you know, I was kind of angry with him. But I'm not angry with him anymore. I'm here to praise him and honor him and give him all the glory yes. because I'm here to tell the story of what's going on. He still has more for me to do. Amen. 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 So what year did you officially become ordained? Um, well, I got licensed in two, 2013, okay. and I'm going to go on working on being ordained. I got to take a few more classes, and then we'll be officially ordained and get my doctorate degree. Okay, so where are you currently um, ministering at now? And right now, I'm at Union Baptist Church in Cambridge. I'm on a mineral staff out there with Miss O'Bannon brought me there, you know, my partner in crime who's in the play as well. So, you know, I was going back and forth to churches. You know how you learn, take your experience with you. And I was like, you know, come back. She said one day, said, well, just come to my church. We'll make you happy there. So I visited, you know, came there back and forth. I just stayed there. Every Sunday I was there. And then finally she said to the pastor, you know, you got a minister sitting back here. He goes, she is? She goes, Mr. Miss Ben. He goes, yes, she is. And so then one day he said, well, I want you to meet with the deacons and, the, you know, the council. And I met with them one Saturday. And then he said, well, next Sunday you will be on the pulpit and we will introduce you as one of the ministerial staffs. Oh, and praise so I got God. It. And that praise was uh, yeah. last year, 2017. Come December, on. Christmas Day, 2017. Well, we're about to hear some of your ministry at um, <laughs> Union Baptist Church. Oh, um, well, before we get to that, do you have, like, er any earliest memories of being in the church? Like, what do you Like, know? growing up as a kid. Growing up as a kid? Yeah. Well, the only memory I know, we used to, I used to be, y'all said I couldn't sing, but I used to be in the junior choir. <laughs> in junior choir, you know, like I said, I was on the lay staff in confirmation. I was a confirmation. I was a youth minister as well, you know. So I went through confirmations and different things. I had growing up and doing different things in the church, you know, okay. just helping out the pastor, whatever I can. All right, you know, so we're going to get ready to hear Minister Mo Mosley um, preaching at Union Baptist Church. Have a banquet. A sumptuous feast mm -hmm. yeah. and an elaborate and often ceremony meal with numerous people after in honor of a person. A meal held in recognition in some occasion or achievement. Mm -hmm. A large meal complete with main course and desserts mm -hmm. often served mm -hmm. with alcohol beverages, wine, and beer. Well, Luke 14, verse 7, 14. Jesus advised people not to rush for the best seats in the feast. People today are just as eager to raise their social status, whether by being with the right people, dressing for success, or driving the right car. Wanting a nice car or hoping to be successful in your career it's not wrong in itself. It is wrong only when you want these things just to impress others. Well. Whom do you try to impress? Don't aim for prestige. Look for a place to serve. If God wants you to serve on a wilder scale, he will invite you to take a higher place. Uh -huh. People need to know God is watching you, so you need to stop hiding. We might not know what you're doing, but he sure does. Yes, sir. <coughs> In today's gospel again, Jesus, Jesus uses the subject of table manners to teach the Pharisees 
the Lord took my lesson in humility and hospitality. He tells them not to assume a place of honor of someone else's table, and when they give you dinner, they should not invite friends, relatives, or influential people on the understanding that they may have to invite them to their home in return. Instead, Jesus asks them to open their hearts to the poor. Amen, amen, amen. And God is always watching, and we're not here to uh, place on this earth to impress other people. We're only here to press the Lord. Lord amen. And speaking about one of his servants, my next guest is Mark Fortz. <laughs> now, Mark Fortz, can you tell my audience a little something about yourself? Well, I too first would first like to give honor and praise to my Lord Jesus Christ, for without him I would not be here, and I would not be able to do the work that I'm doing. Um, again, my name is uh, Mark Fortz, and um, I am one of the principal um, cast members of the Oscar Michaud Family Theatre Program. And I, at that time, I'd just like to thank Mr. Haywood Fennell for also allowing me to be a part of such a wonderful cast yes. and, and theatre group. Um, I got into the um, theatre uh, cast as a cast member uh, because of my daughter, Sky, who's sitting next to me here. Um, I first brought her to uh, audition, and then uh, I said, I want to do this also. So then I um, got into it, and we, I first started with the uh, Harlem Renaissance. Uh, we visited with a Gospel Flavor, which is another one of our productions, and I played um, a homeless guy, mm. uh, such a serious role. Uh, it was, it, I loved it, I loved it. And um, so I got promoted. And, uh, <laughs> and then the next one on- um, Oh, can you tell us how you got promoted, because of what? Ah, uh, because of my fantastic acting ability. Besides that, you know, <laughs> he has another ability too. He knows how to sing. Ah, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I used to mess around a little voc vocally, and um, and I did uh, do a little piece um, in the um, Harlem Renaissance. Uh, we visited with a gospel flavor, and then I was cast to be uh, Mr. Roland Hayes, Mr. Roland Hayes in the Marian Anderson project. Uh, now. Mr. Roland Hayes was a serious dude. Yes, he was. Oh man, uh, Mr. Roland Hayes. He was born in the. Uh, late 1890s, and um, he was a lyrical tenor, tenor mm -hmm. and composer who um, did a lot of the uh, Negro spirituals that we hear still today. And um, he also spoke on the un, uh, injustice, on social injustice, and he was an activist, um, and he did not play. And he was a very, very intellectual, but a very passionate uh, man, very well-spoken, such a gentleman. And uh, it was a pleasure to play him and um, I hope I bring to the character uh, something that uh, people will take away from what Mr. Roland Hayes was really about. And, uh, and, and you're, you're passionate um, in other aspects in this community too. You're very active in the basketball community. Can you tell us a little something about that? Yes, I have a, uh, an affection for our youth. Mm -hmm. And um, I always wanted to be involved in their upbringing and, and, and wanted to be a part of the lives of our youth in the community. Yes. So I began uh, doing what I felt that I could do a little bit of, and that was basketball. I was able to play basketball at a very young age, and I uh, was pretty good. And um, so I thought that I should teach. So I began teaching at the Roxbury YMCA um, youth basketball for our age group from like uh, six to nine, and then from 10 to 12-year-old youths. And uh, I did that for, uh, for about 25 years uh, mm -hmm. there at the Roxbury YMCA as well as the uh, Roxbury Boys and Girls Club. Okay. Um, I was there for, out of that 25 years, I was at the Roxbury Boys Club for about maybe five years, five mm -hmm. to six years, somewhere in there. And um, so, yeah, it was very fulfilling. Um, it's, it's great when you see the children that we uh, help mentor and you see them today and they remember the impact that you had on their lives. Yes. Um, it, it's very fulfilling and I was, felt great about doing that, yeah. Now, do you have any uh, stories about one of the ch children that you mentored? Oh, yeah, I do actually. I was um, traveling, we was in Disney, Florida mm -hmm. with my family and we was returning and um, you know, you're tired, you're worn out from coming back from, uh, from Disney and um, I'm in the airport and all of a sudden, I just hear, Coach Mark, Coach Mark. And I turn around, and I'm like, wow, 
who's this in Florida calling me? And it was like, Mom, there's my coach. There's my coach. He came up to me and gave me a, a huge hug, and it just felt so great that he was able to recognize me, you know, for being such an influence to him, and which reminds me of another short little story that I have. Um, I also did baseball. I also coached baseball for our youth, and I did that for about six years and, um, at the uh, Franklin Field uh, baseball field over there in Dorchester. And, um, gentlemen, I'm filling out my roster for my team, and it was a hot, hot summer day. And all of a sudden, this big shade came over me. And I just looked up, and there was this just gentleman there. He was about 6'5", 260 pounds, somewhere in there. And I said, uh, could I help you? <laughs> and he said, uh, you don't remember me? And I'm like, no. <laughs> he said, uh, you coached me in uh, Pee Wee basketball. And this yeah. is, again, when it was between the ages of six and nine. He was like, you coached me in Pee Wee basketball. Well, my first question was, was I good to you? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, you was fantastic. He said, I went to college I, you know, because of you and, and the things that you instilled in me as a ball player on the court and off the court because we also um, – specialized in making sure that they did their schoolwork and things like that. We kept in contact with the parents and everything. So that was another gratifying moment outside the basketball court, yeah, how I touched them uh, personally, you know. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's always good to have a positive male role model in our community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's mm -hmm. what we need more of exactly. these days. Mm -hmm. Now, our next guest will be your daughter, Miss Sky Fort. <laughs> so Miss Sky, can you tell us a little something about yourself? Well, well, yeah, my name is Guy Forts. Um, I'm 14, going on 15 in May, May 28th. And um, I'm from Hyde Park. I go to Boston Arts Academy. I go there for theater. My major is theater. I actually auditioned for vocals and theater, and I picked theater because I do so much, like, singing outside of school. Like, I, singing was, like, my first love. Okay. Like, I always, I've sang, like, my whole life, basically. Okay. Like, even, like, when I was in my mom's stomach. Mm. <laughs> it's like a little story. She would always tell me this story. I was in my mom's stomach, and she would pray, and she would say, well, I want you to be a singer. <laughs> and she would say, I want you to be better than Beyonce. I want you to be better than Rihanna. And actually, here I am. <laughs> and I actually started actually singing at around the age of six or seven. <clears throat> and um, I was, this is a, another story, mm -hmm. so I was in the car and I was singing a song um, on the radio and when the song was over I told her, well mom, I want to be a singer, I want to be famous and I told her I want to be in voice lessons, I want to take voice lessons, so my mom and my dad put me in voice lessons and I've done like a whole bunch of performances in the city of Boston, mm. like a whole bunch of venues in Boston. I've done a lot of singing. In my, well, in my past years, I've done dancing too. Mm -hmm. And I do act. And I'm part of the Oscar Michel Family Theater Program. Okay. So, so what some, are some of the venues that you performed in around here? Mm. I performed in a place called Cheap Seats, mm -hmm. um, where I performed a Janae Aiko song and a John Legend song. Um, I've performed in the Strand Theater. I've done community auditions in the Strand Theater. I've been in there a few times. Mm -hmm. um, the, oh, where did we have rehearsal at? Blackstone. <laughs> Blackstone, yeah. Um, <laughs> Blackstone Community <laughs> Center. I performed in there. Um, Boys Club. Yeah, Boys Club. Performed a lot of places. There's so many places I can't even. Well, Lawless. You performed oh, the best of Oh, yeah, Lawless. Yes. I did about. 20 songs there. Yeah, okay. Well, your, mo your mom's prayer has been answered <laughs> and, um, because you have such a beautiful voice. Thank you. And we are about to hear some of your singing right now. <clears throat> you talked about you did a John Legend song. Yeah. And I think we're going to um, see that video clip. Let's go. Thank you. 
Another beautiful voice, Sky Forts, singing Take It Slow. And this was at Cheap Seats in the concert that she did. What a wonderful job. And our next guest has another, is another lady with a beautiful voice. And this is Sister Monica Anderson Spencer. Welcome, Sister Monica Anderson Spencer. Can you please tell us about yourself? Um, well, first giving honor to God and to Jesus Christ who's the head of my life. Um, I'm, I primarily think of myself as a servant. Yes. Let's start there. Um, I am a singer, an educator, music educator. I often, um, currently I'm um, employed as a long-term substitute in Hopkinton, Massachusetts in the middle school um, as a chorus director. I have spent the most of my life as a um, singer and chorus director. Originally, um, when I was in college, I had uh, I started out as a voice major, mm -hmm. and my mother wanted to know wanted to know well what can you do if if you get a degree in voice what can you do? She said you can sing right and I said yes. She said well what else can you do? <laughs> and I said well I suppose she said can you teach? I said well yes I suppose. She said well what else? I want, to, I want you to be able to get a job. So she convinced me um, <laughs> uh, with great urgency to change my major to music education. So my degrees, uh, my bachelor's and master's are both in music education. Um, my undergrad was um, with vocal emphasis and college was vocal and choral, chorus um, conducting emphasis. So I've, um, and I remember thinking, uh, because I come from a family of educators, a family of teachers, and the last thing I wanted to do was teach. I really did not want to teach. And I remember when I was doing my, um, I was doing my uh, practicum, my student teaching in Washington, D.C., in the middle of the ghetto, um, and two weeks into my nine-week uh, student teaching, my teacher had to be hospitalized, so I was in the classroom by myself. And I remember grading some test papers and getting so excited mm -hmm. when the kids did well, and I remember thinking, oh no, they got me. Um, but it was, uh, it was at that point that I realized that teaching was something that I enjoyed and perhaps was cut out to do. And I remember having a class of um, because it was a junior high school, and it was grades 7th, 8th, and nine, 
and I remember I had a class of ninth graders and I remember to this day, and we're talking decades ago, um, that it was, the, the homeroom was section 9003. And the, um, I knew that that meant that the class was in the basement. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, why are they keeping these boys in the basement? And there were over 30 names, so like 36 or 37 names on the roster. But there was never more than about 20 people in class at any one time, and I remember there was one boy that was consistently absent, and I remember thinking, well, does anybody know anything about him? And somebody said, well, he's not going to get paroled until March. And I thought, uh, no, someone said, oh, he's out for the rest of the year. And then somebody else said, oh, no, well, he's going to get paroled in March. And I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's, you know, you was talking about the, you going to school and all that. Mm -hmm. You failed to mention what school did you go to? Oh, I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. H.U. 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 here too. I went to Howard too. <laughs> yes, Howard yes. Howard University in the house. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. And um, for all that I can say about the experience of being at an HBCU, yes. uh, it was a very, because um, although at that time Washington, D.C. was primarily a, uh, we all called it Chocolate City, mm -hmm. um, but there was still a very insular um, feeling of being in the middle of the middle of the city and um, still being very protected and the teachers really cared about you. They really wanted you to do well and they insisted upon excellence and I have to give Howard University credit for that because um, it always uh, aims, makes me aim to, to work harder and to strive harder for, for what is important and to be able to take a step back and look at the big picture and say what is important here and to really strive for that. So I thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yes, and then when you do sing, you definitely strive for excellence because your voice is just tremendous. Oh, and um, thank you. we are about to hear you singing. Um, we're about to go to a video, another clip by right quick and this is called Laudate Domino. Laudate Dominum. Dominum. Mm -hmm. And Sister Monica is singing it with the Heritage Call. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the clip.
And we're back to Going Uptown. This is your host, Tyree Brown, AKA Uptown Brown. And I am joined today by the principals of the Oscar Michaud Family Theater Program Company, as well as the cast of the Miss Marian Anderson and Friends Project. Um, the Miss Marian Anderson and Friends Project will be coming soon to the Blackstone Community Theater um, Center on April 6th, Friday, April 6th at 6.30 p.m. and Saturday, April 7th at 2 p.m. at the Blackstone Community Center located on West Newton Street. Now, I would like to thank my guests for today. Again, um, Ms. Deborah Mosley, um, Ms. Skye and Mark Fortz, and Sister Monica Anderson Spencer. We are going to take a break right quick and to hear from our PCA, and we will be back shortly. They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you. If you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Deaths and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size. And we're back. This, and we're back. This is Going Uptown with Tyree Brown. And I am joined by the cast of the Oscar Michaud Family Data Program Company as we sit here and talk about Miss Marian Anderson. On the left of Sister Monica, there is a commemorative stamp of Marian Anderson that was made public on January 27, 2005. And I would like to thank Miss Valerie Fox for donating it to our cause. Um, I'm here with the cast of the Oscar Michelle Family Theatre Program once again, and we are going to talk about Miss Marian Anderson. Sister Monica, who is Marian Anderson? Well, Marian Anderson was um, a contralto, a, classical, a classically trained and classical singer um, who, um, as we mentioned before, was uh, born in the, uh, there's some differences about her actual birth year, but uh, the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the uh, 20th century, and she was one of the greatest voices of the 20th century. Yes, she, was. she was born in Philadelphia, and um, by the, in the middle of the 1920s, I would think it was around 23, she performed with the New York Philharmonic Or Orchestra in front of a um, in front of a crowd of 7,500 people. So she already had that kind of reputation. And, um, but she still was not able to perform the way she wanted to, to anyone who could afford to buy a ticket. And back then, it, um, it was much, of course, much more uh, affordable uh, to purchase tickets for, to concerts. But um, there were people who insisted that her audiences, or venues insist that her audiences um, remain segregated, and uh, that was something that she refused to abide by. She also um, was refused certain, um, just to perform in certain venues. So as many African Americans did at that time, she chose to go to Europe. And that was something that continued to happen well into the 1960s and 70s, that to, um, to, to make just a, 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 a correlation, the great singer Jesse Norman, who was also a Howard University graduate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, went to Europe uh, to begin her career and did, um, did very well. In fact, she was so popular in, um, in Europe that in 1976, when um, 
uh, when France was celebrating its, two, its bicentennial, they invited her to sing the French national anthem. Mm. And we're talking about an African-American woman was invited to sing the French national anthem. Um, so again, just making the correlation to how um, blacks were often treated in Europe compared to how we were treated at home, and I put emphasis at home. Um, but Marian Anderson would not be deterred. She sang before the crowned heads of Europe. She sang many, many concerts. She did not feel comfortable as an actress so she, although she was invited to, and um, asked to sing at a number of, with a number of opera houses, she would decline because she would prefer to sing in what we call in concert and not uh, have to act on stage. But interestingly enough, sometimes a concert is more difficult because in a, a concert, you were singing a number of different different songs by different composers. She did, would sing a number of arias, uh, songs from operas, and when you do that, you really have to assume the character wow. of, the, of, the, of who the character would have been in the, um, in the theater piece. So in a way, she was continuing to, she was acting, but just not in costume and um, on an operatic stage or, or theater stage. And in um, 1955, she was the first African American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, she sang the, the role Ulrika in um, Unbalo de Mascara, and she, um, Unbalo in Mascara, uh, forgive me. And it was the first time that uh, an African American had sung at the Met. Now, there had New York City Opera did have a, some, uh, an African American sing before that, um, but the Met was always seen as the American Mecca of opera. And interestingly enough, there was a coach, an African-American coach named Sylvia Olden Lee, mm -hmm. who was uh, the first African-American vocal coach at the, at the Metropolitan Opera. And she was one of the people that insisted that this is someone that they should have on their, um, on their stage. This is time. And it was really at the end of Marian Anderson's career, but uh, so she was never officially on the roster mm -hmm. of the Met. Um, Sylvia, but through Sylvia's um, insistence, they did have uh, invite her to come and sing that season. And um, I take liberties by calling her Sylvia because she was also my vocal coach. Wow. I, I coached with her wow. and. Um, she was the one that would tell us these stories about, um, about Marian Anderson, and uh, she was also uh, instrumental in hiring two of the first uh, African Americans at the Met, uh, Robert McFarland, uh, I'm sorry, um, Robert McFerrin, forgive mm -hmm. me, uh, who was the first on the roster, and people, the name may sound familiar if, um, if anybody's familiar with Bobby McFerrin, Bobby McFerrin is his son. Happy. Exactly. <laughs> Bobby McFerrin is his son. Um, and uh, Madawilda Dobbs was the first woman, African American woman, who was my voice teacher. Okay. So, um, so I, I feel again that um, I had a great responsibility and inherited a, a great legacy of, um, of classical singers because um, people don't often think about. Um, when we, we always think about African Americans in the arts, but mm -hmm. sometimes we don't think about the classical side. And um, we've contributed a great deal, uh, not only as performers, but also um, as composers, as uh, their or um, currently their orchestral conductors who are, um, but who are uh, operating in the classical world. But for many years, that was not the case. And because of people like Marian Anderson, who forged a path, who mm -hmm. insisted upon excellence and fought against injustice, along with um, one of our dear friends, Roland Hayes. Um, they opened doors for others, for those of us to come through. And um, you know, for that, we are eternally grateful. Oh, yes, we are. Uh, I do want to make just uh, one, uh, just want to make a note of um, the fact that 
when she was denied singing um, by the Daughters of the American Revolution at Constitution Hall. Constitution Hall is actually in Washington, D.C. Mm. And um, she was denied more than once. This was the second time that they came back um, and said that uh, it wasn't so much about Mrs. Anderson. It was just she was, they were concerned that there would be some sort of trouble if she, uh, if she sang there. And um, well, she said, you know, very well, I, I won't sing. But those people who supported her knew that she deserved to have um, a venue and an opportunity to sing for the people who wanted to hear her. Again, we're talking about one of the great, greatest voices of the 20th century. Yeah. And um, you always, well, I shouldn't say you always, but very often when you think of great voices, people think of sopranos and they think of tenors, and they don't often think about the, um, the, the voice of the, me of the contralto. And for her to be a uh, esteemed and well-renowned contralto, was, was quite an accomplishment in and of itself. But when she did sing, um, her very influential friends, which included Eleanor Roosevelt, mm -hmm. uh, she sang April, the um, Easter Sunday of 1939 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and before a crowd of um, 75,000, I believe it was, um, uh, people just poured out to, to hear her. And, and rightly so because uh, not only was it a statement that um, it doesn't matter where I sing, it's the fact that I am singing that mm -hmm. made the difference and the fact that people came out to support her. So in a very uh, real way, it was a protest, yeah. um, a protest against uh, those people who would continue. It wasn't just the Daughters of American Revolution. They just happened to be the focal point because they were the ones in the news and they were the ones that were saying no. But there were many other um, places that were giving them the same line, uh, saying the same things, or yes, you can perform, but the audiences will have to be segregated. Mm -hmm. And when you pay the same money as everybody else, you wanna be able to choose the seat that you would like to sit and not have to sit in the balcony or in the back or wherever um, the segregated uh, colored seats, colored section would happen to be. So um, this was a, a statement. So, I, um, so she pretty much, like at first she did not want to sing in front of the Lincoln Memorial because, you know, she was battling, you know, the hostility and stuff like that. But then she opened up to try to pave the way for other singers to come right after her. Yes. That's kind of like Richard Allen. You know, this is one thing that I love about Marian Anderson and Richard Allen. You know, Richard Allen was from Philadelphia also, and he started the AME churches, yes. you know, because mm -hmm. they was part of the <coughs> Methodist church and they were segregated too. And he was like, you know what? I'm tired of sitting in the back of the pews. I want to be up front. I want to mm -hmm. worship and be around my people and have a good worship service. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, he started the African Methodist Episcopal Church mm -hmm. where, you know, blacks were allowed to worship their own worship service and, and became very successful and is big today. Mm -hmm. So it opened doors for other blacks. So we talking about Marian Anderson paving the way for singers. We talking about Richard Allen paving the way for ministries and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, you know, we have to honor and respect our ancestors. Absolutely. But, you know, our show is about to end pretty soon. But before we leave, I just want to talk about some of the characters that each of y'all play in the place. Um, I, Minister Debbie already said that she played Miss Evelyn. <laughs> Miss Darling. Darling, she played Miss <laughs> Darling. So how's the character similar, to, who, well, who is Miss Darling? Mm, good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's a barmaid, you know, for Miss Evelyn. I work mm -hmm. for Miss Evelyn. Well, yeah, I work for Miss Evelyn, but I do all the work. And mm -hmm. um, we so, just, like I said, we everyone comes to and Miss Evelyn's delight, you know, like Marion Anderson, Roland Hayes, Zora Neale Hilston, at the waters. I mean, they all just come through there, you know, just go to, and I'm just looking at everybody and just saying, wow, I'm going to be like that someday too, you know. Like I said, they sing, they dance, and do everything, but I'm just 
a, a little sassy sometimes when I want to be. Then I can be funny. Then I can be me flamboyant too if I want to. Yeah. But you know, that's what Miss Ever, Miss Miss Darling is all about. You know, the love that you know we share together. You know, like me with Miss Evelyn. You know, where you know we're like would you say Cagney and Lacey and mm -hmm. what you call it, <laughs> like a bond that we had, the chemistry is so strong there, Lucy and Ethel. you know, <laughs> you know, okay, Lucy and Ethel, <laughs> those type of characters, you know, we do portray that, and okay. that's the type of person we are, but you know, I have my little broom all the time, and I'd be constantly sweeping during the whole play, so for one time I may drop the broom when I go turn off the radio, when Miss Evelyn, Evelyn tells me to turn off the radio, you know, and I just love the part when they all come through there, and, you know, like when, Miss, when Mary Anderson comes through there and she acted with Roland Hayes, it was just like, wow, Roland Hayes, mm -hmm. Mary Anderson, oh my goodness, you know, you know, just wonderful just to see this, you know, because, you know, we don't know, like I said, when I first came there, I didn't know all this stuff, you know, about Mary Anderson, you know, I knew some stuff, but I didn't know everything, like at the Waters, I found out that at the Waters is from Pennsylvania as well, my hometown, Chester, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and she was my grandmother's best friend. Okay, good stuff. Small world, small so, world. You know, so. so, Sky, you play Miss Lena Horn in the play. <laughs> Can you tell us a little something about Lena Horn? Um, well, Lena Horn is a beautiful, legendary jazz and pop singer. Um, she also did acting, and she was also a dancer. <clears throat> she, she actually, she was in a lot of movies, and one of the movies that she was and was The Wiz, mm. who also had Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. Um, yeah, she was just a very beautiful singer, and she did a lot. She would go around the world, and she was very passionate about equal rights, and she talked about social injustice, and she did a lot. Okay. So without giving, any, uh, giving anything away in a play, can you just tell us your favorite line right quick? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, got me going back, trying to think of the lines I got. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, I can't. All right. It's not coming to me right mm -hmm. now. So <laughs> what, what's, what's the biggest challenge in taking that role? Do you have any, <coughs> see any challenges in playing Lena Horn? Yes. So, um, I feel like Lena Horn is so, she, she could be like sassy, but she does it in such a, like a, a yeah, like a classical way, like. I feel like we're different, like we're two different people. Like, if I'm being sassy, I'm sassy. Mm -hmm. But she does it in such a classy way, and mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of hard for me to play that kind of role because it's just so different from the way that I actually am. That's one of the biggest challenge for me. <laughs> Good stuff. And Mark, you already told the world about <laughs> Roland Hayes already, so. I'm just so excited. So, <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do you see any similarities between you and him? Um. Again, yeah, first of all, I just want to thank, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to, to be on the same stage with uh, Miss Monica playing Miss uh, Marian Anderson. Yes. Uh, it's a pleasure watching you, and, and to be on stage with you is a challenge in itself, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. But uh, yes, as I stated, uh, well, to something like me, um, I can be a little serious when I need to be. Um, I do stick up for uh, social injustice and, and um, the equal rights of our people, and uh, that's why I took so much of my time into community mm -hmm. and in the, uh, the basketball, that's something that I didn't know about, so that's why I wanted to always give back. So I always felt as though that that was a connection that I had with, with him in regards to his seriousness and his commitment to what he felt was right and, you know, and had to do the things that he felt was right. You know. Um, but Roland Hayes is, uh, you know, like I said, he, he also has some roots here in Boston. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he has, uh, he actually, you know, God rest his soul, he uh, passed away here in Boston. Um, but he has a daughter that uh, still is in Massachusetts. I'm not sure if it's Boston, but I know it's in Massachusetts. Um, Afrika um, Hayes. Um, I don't know if she has a married name now, mm -hmm. but uh, she's still um, in the area now. Um, mm -hmm. She's, uh, you know, up in age now, but um, I'm sure that she... Um, did the same thing as which her father was doing too. So it's a pleasure playing him. It's a pleasure playing him. He's a serious, educated, uh, well-developed, uh, but no-nonsense type of a guy. And he'll let you know, from what I understand, that um, he actually almost got into a few fist fights. Whoa. <laughs> Sticking up for what he felt was right, a 
of the injustices that was um, in the community and, and of his people. And one of the lines in which he said it was, um, our time is now. Yeah. You know, that's one of my favorite lines because our time is now. Our time is now. <laughs> you, know? <Yes. laughs> you know, so I love that because that still speaks to today. Yes. Because you know, yes. our time is now. Yes, it is. You got to stand in demand stand in and demand. make things happen. You That's know right. what I'm saying? That's right. Don't talk about it. Just go out there and be about it. That's right. Now, my final question. Besides yourself in the play, which actor in this production is going to make people, going to blow people's mind? Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes. <laughs> yes, Langston. Langston. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because democracy would not come. <laughs> Yes, I'm also in the play too. I play Langston Hughes. Um, I'm fed up with the opportunities to not be able to use my power here in America. So, you know, since I have the power of language and people in America do not want to hear me, I get frustrated and want to go to Europe. So I say a little poem called Democracy, and I say that democracy would never come. But I'm not going to go into the poem right now. You will have to come to the Blackstone Community Center on April 6th. Friday at 6.30 and um, Saturday, April 7th at 2 o'clock. And to see all of us play in the um, Miss Marian Anderson and Friends Project. We do have an excellent class. Um, not all of us is not here right now, but I do want to give a shout out to Miss Irene O'Bannon, who, who plays Miss Evelyn, the owner of Evelyn's Delight. <clears throat> I want to give a shout out to up our new um, cast members. Ms. Crystal Dodson, who plays um, Zora Neale Hurston, Ms. Jiju Brown, who plays um, Josephine Baker, Ms. Mr. Eddie Hassel, who plays Claude McKay, and we have two new, new newspaper women, um, um, Sheila Burke and Lisa Robinson. But, and, who, and of course, of course, how can we forget Mr. Melvin Francisco, who plays Thomas A. Dorsey, and our up-and-coming star, Jarrell O'Bannon, who plays the newspaper boy. But I'm about to wrap this up. I, I want to thank all my um, guests for today. I want to thank the crew, and I want to thank you, the audience, for watching us today. See you next time on Going Uptown with Tyree Brown. Thank you.